Welcome to the What is Stoicism podcast. This episode is a reading of Cicero's third Stoic paradox, in which he explains how all vices and all virtues are equal. What this means is that all good deeds are equally meritorious and all bad deeds are equally heinous. All virtues are equal as this corresponds to the same impulse towards the good. Cicero doesn't attempt to defend the stoic position of the moral equality of all offences. Instead, he offers a weakened version that offences of the same sort are equal. He notes the stoic position that all crimes are equal, since they all involve the same intent to break the law. But he then argues that crimes do not bear the same penalty, since the matter depends on the status of the person injured and that of the criminal. Thus he ends up imposing gradations of vice based on external factors. Here's what he says. Misdeeds are equal and good deeds are equal. You say it's an unimportant thing, but it is a great moral lapse. Wrongdoings must be weighed against the vices of man, not by the event itself. The wrongdoing in itself may be either major or minor, but regardless of how it is viewed, a wrongdoing is a thing unto itself. A captain may cause a ship with a cargo of gold or chaff to run aground, but the difference is trifling. What matters is the ineptitude of the captain. Passion has caused a moral indiscretion, for example, regarding a woman of low birth. Shame reaches a smaller number here than if the shame, born of impudence, had involved a woman of high birth and virginal. But the passion has done wrong nonetheless, since to commit a wrongdoing is to cross certain lines. And once you have done this, the offence is complete. To progress a certain distance once you have crossed this line, this is not relevant in the increasing of the guilt. No one is permitted to sin. What is forbidden, however, is, on this one point, not permitted to be endorsed or argued for. If this forbidden thing is never able to become greater or smaller, because it is a wrongdoing in this sense if it is not permitted, then the wrongdoings originating from this fact ought to be seen as equal, as one is the same as the other. Since virtues are equal to each other, it must follow that vices are also equal to each other. And virtues are indeed equal. It can easily be seen that no one can be better than a good man, nor more temperate than a temperate man, nor more upright than an upright man. Do you call him a good man who returns ten pounds of gold to you, when he could have, with impunity, enriched himself with it? if he did not do the same thing with 10,000 pounds of gold? Or do you call a man temperate who contains himself in one type of indulgence, but who loses himself in another? Unified virtue is in accord with reason and perpetual constancy. Nothing here can be added to it to make the virtue greater, and nothing subtracted such that the name of the virtue is lost. If good deeds are things done rightly, and nothing is more right than a right thing, then it is certain that nothing that can be found is better than the good. It follows then that vices are equal, if indeed vices are held to be defects of the mind. And because vices are equal, good deeds when they proceed from virtues ought to be equal. In the same way, it is necessary that wrongdoings, because they flow from vices, are equal. You say, you take these ideas from the philosophers. I fear you would say that I took them from a trafficker. Socrates used to argue in this way. Yes, you speak the truth. For the man you brought into the conversation was, to our memory, a learned and wise man. But I ask you, when we dispute with words and not with physical fighting, should we ask what manual laborers or porters think about goods, or what learned men think about these things? Especially as this sentiment is not only the truest, but also the most useful, that anyone can find for the life of a man, For what power exists that may keep all men away from depravity more than the idea that there is no distinction between wrongdoings, that it is an equal offence if they raise their hand against a private person or a magistrate, or that it is the same blemish of lust, no matter in what home they bring their lewd behaviour? Now someone may say, is there no difference whether someone kills a slave or his father? If you put these things plainly, their relative merits cannot easily be judged. To rob one's father of his life is a crime in itself. The inhabitants of Saguntum, who prefer that their own parents die as free men rather than live as slaves, committed parricide. Thus in theory it is possible that a parent can be deprived of life 
without a crime being committed. And at the same time, a servant cannot be deprived of life without a wrongdoing being committed. Therefore, the reasons for the action, and not the nature of the action, is the distinguishing thing. The motive attaches to that for which it has a propensity. If the motive is linked to both actions equally, it is necessary that they be considered equal to each other. But there is a difference. In the killing of a servant, if it is seen as a wrongdoing, one has sinned only once, but many sins are committed in violating the life of one's father. He who produced us is violated. He who nurtured us, educated us, who placed us in hearth, home and society. The harming of one's father is at the forefront of moral wrongs and is worthy of the severest punishment. But in life we ought not to ponder what punishment is worthy of a moral feeling, but how much wrongdoing a person may commit. Whatever should not be a crime, one may not think of as a crime, even in small things. Yes, if indeed we cannot invent certain things, we can impose a state of mind on ourselves. If an actor moves himself just a little outside a correct dramatic routine, or if his recited verses are one syllable too short or too long, he is hissed and booed off the stage. In life, will you, who ought to be in every gesture more controlled and in every verse more correct, say that you may transgress by one syllable? I do not listen to a poet who makes mistakes in little things. In everyday society, do I listen to a citizen counting his transgressions with his fingers, thinking, if they are seen to be smaller, they may be considered less serious? How can they be seen as smaller, when whatever sin was committed was a sin caused by a perturbation of natural reason and order? And once this perturbation in reason and order has been committed, is it not true that nothing can be added to make the sin seem any greater?